You said, I like to go in with an open mind. And it's interesting that that drops the anxiety because now you're not going in like, is this going to be an argument? Is this going to be yeah. high tension? It doesn't have to be. You try to be as objective as possible and just remember like all human interactions are going to be impacted by what energy we bring to the interaction. And I tell this to the roofers all the time too. I'm like, look, if you're showing up and the adjuster is expecting you to just be another jackass who's up in arms, who's gonna be difficult and like beat on, beat on his chest and demand the sun and the stars, guess how they're gonna respond, right? Welcome to Adjuster TV Radio. I'm here with Becca Switzer from RoofSalesMastery.com and brought her on today because we want to talk about um, the importance of sales um, in the adjusting process and kind of get a little bit of a different perspective from somebody who has been heavily involved in um, roofing sales or construction sales for a number of years. She's been on YouTube for looks like at least seven years now consistently putting out content to help roofing contractors and roof salespeople to um, really kind of level up their careers and uh, reach their, accomplish and reach their goals. So welcome, Becca. Really glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. So you said you were in the mountains. Like, where are you at? You're in Colorado? I am. I'm way up here. I could show you. I am in, up in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I live um, in Clear Creek County, which is about an hour west of Denver. So I'm just oh boy. Here in the boonies. I think a lot people. of us, a lot Sorry. of us would call that paradise, not the boonies. <laughs> um, well, it's uh, definitely paradise. I, I love yeah. it. So, uh, like I said, I mean, you've you've been on on YouTube forever. Um, kind of give us a little bit of a, your, your background, like, you know, what were you doing before you, you were kind of a YouTube influencer and, and sort of what's your history with, with all this? So I graduated high school in 2006 and I went to the university of Iowa for like two years. And at the time, really the only thing I was interested in doing was writing. So I was looking into journalism and maybe marketing or something like that. And uh, after my sophomore year of college, I went home for the summer. My school is like four hours away from my hometown. And my plan was just to work my fast food job over the summer, make some money to go back to school. And when I got back to my, my parents' house, there was a recruiting letter there from Vector Marketing, which is Cutco Cutlery, if you're familiar with the okay. knives. Yep. Of college kids, um, high schoolers, like the scissors that cut the penny and all. So they're really, oh, yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. So selling my, it. Uh, Right. Still, well, and still I, selling it. <laughs> absolutely. All, every day, right? <laughs> They're in my kitchen. I have two sets right now. <laughs> if you need anything, email Becca Switzer at gmail.com. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, I ended up, long story short, I ended up taking the sales job for the summer and um, I ended up making like $35,000 or something sure. over a summer as a college kid. I'd never seen that kind of money before. Oh, boy. And uh, like, what would I go back to school for? Like, I'm right. good at this and I don't need a degree. I really don't know what I'm doing at college right now. So I ended up dropping out of school and selling Cutco knives for like a year and a half. And then at that time I met my then husband, we're since divorced, but he was my manager at the time. Sure. And I remember one day we were getting married in 2010 or something like that. And a couple months before that, he's like, do you think you could sell roofs? And I'm like, like, like roofs. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I'm like, I mean, probably if someone like tells me what to say, you know, right. Right. And so he's like, well, I've been talking to this guy and he's been recruiting, you know, Cutco people. And cause we were trying to kind of transition out of Cutco. He'd been doing it for six years. I'd been doing it for a year and a half. And, uh, we got into the storm restoration conversation with somebody and the guy was recruiting us really hard unbeknownst to us. He was the vice president of the second largest storm restoration company, like national storm restoration company in the country. Okay. He was breaking off to start his own company. And so he was kind of headhunting salespeople, like the best of the best, you know, in different sales industries. So we, we agreed to do this thing. We saw all of our stuff. We travel halfway across the country. Our first storm location was in Meriden, Connecticut. And uh, we show up Yikes. on the scene. Yeah. And the guy's <laughs> like, running on fumes like red bull three hours of sleep just like frazzled and he's Yikes. like uh 
well, go into this, this neighborhood and then like, listen to Chris knock doors. He's been doing this for a while. He's pretty good. Listen to him. And then here's a stack of contracts, knock a hundred doors a day. It's a numbers game. You'll figure it out. And I'm like, uh -huh. okay. I just sold everything I owned, moved halfway across the country. I have no clue what I'm doing. I don't know. The anything wild about west. I know nothing. Yeah. I'm like, what? And my ex, unfortunately, bless his heart. He wasn't very good at it. Like door to door closing, nice He's a great manager, good sales trainer, not a very good salesperson. So it was like up to me to figure out how to do this. So fast forward about probably a year and a half or so, maybe two years. And we were looking for some training. What we were trying to do is find some roof sales training, like certainly somewhere in the world, somebody in this entire industry, which is a multi-billion dollar a year industry, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody has to be doing some training. Nobody was. <laughs> and nobody was. Like if you Googled roof sales training, it was like, did you mean beef stroganoff recipe? You're like, what? <laughs> so we ended up eventually one winter finding like one tiny little seminar down in Frisco, Texas. And we went to it. It wasn't very good. There were maybe 22 people there. The training itself was just yeah, abysmal. I mean, it was like the equivalent of like kindergarten level sales training stuff. And sure. so my ex was like, you should, you should do that. Like you could do that. Obviously people need it. Nobody's doing it. You're really good at this now. And I had been figuring out the supplement stuff, which is like a huge part of what I teach, you know, in, in, to my clients, my roofing clients. Of course you would. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> right. That's, I mean, that's where you really make proper on your job. We love so. supplements on our side. So, yeah, <laughs> I know this is going to be a point of contention. You guys are left. We can still be friends after this. <laughs> yeah. Right. Maybe. Maybe. But, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. So I ended up writing, I, I went back home after that. And I remember I just sat on my computer and I just started typing everything, everything that I knew. I put it out onto a giant word document. And then that turned into an, uh, my first book. And then the rest of that kind of expanded into me making, which now I have six different online training programs for recruiting and sales training and objection handling and, and, you know, exact me and stuff like that. So that's how I got into it. And of course, you have to get exposure when you're putting out an information project. So I just put out a ton of free content with the intent of if I put out enough good free content and people are like, wow, that stuff's really good. I wonder what the paid stuff is. That's kind of, that right, was my right. method. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Yeah, yeah. No, I listen, I I'm with you. And 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 for a lot of adjusters, I mean their first storm. They will get like if a hurricane, one of these hurricanes, if we get a hurricane this, this fall or this week, I guess, um, it's the same thing. Sometimes, you know, people will hear about this, any kind of like either side of this work, like the week before something hits and they'll rush and get a license and then they'll just show up and then right. they'll get, you know, it's <laughs> the. Not to say that anybody wants anybody to fail, but there's a lot of, it's it's difficult for a lot of the managers when you go to these orientations for them to look in, at people who are, you know, a guy pushes a card and it's got a, a desktop computer on it and a file cabinet, you know, right? When right. we just need a laptop, that guy walks in and it's like looking around and, you know, it's all, he has no idea. It's obviously he hasn't, he's probably shouldn't be there. Right. Managers, yeah, they have trouble giving those guys atten the attention that they because almost they're almost like attention, like, you know, black holes. It doesn't matter how much attention you give them. They are so far not ready that they'll never catch up in time. And so the, they, you know, they tend to triage their, their, you know, sort of limited resources to help people. Um, same thing happened to me, um, sort of when I went to, to go help a friend, um, sell some roofs uh, a few years ago. 
you know, just one of those deals like, hey man, you know, I finished the storm season already. I've been I've been working claims since 1999. And He's like, yeah, come on up and, uh, you know, just give me a hand here to help me with, you know, production and this, that, and the other thing. And I had no idea about anything about commissions and nothing about, you know, buying materials, you know, doing this, doing that, all that. None of that stuff, so knocking on doors. You, when I knock right. on a, somebody's door, they're expecting me, right? They've got, I've got an appointment. Right. So I, and I, and I tell, I say this to adjusters, I say, you know, because they, they give roofers a hard time or they give, uh, yeah, they give contractors a hard time sometimes. And I'm like, listen, those guys don't get paid just for showing up, right? I mean, they just, and those, you know, there's a couple of things that I learned and primarily that I'm, you know, without, like you said, like being told like how to do it exactly like A, B, and C, if they say this, say that, you know, and so on and so forth. I yeah. sucked at it. I was terrible at it. It did not do very well at all. Um, yeah. And mostly no fault of my own because, you know, I should have known better than to just try and jump in and, and say, well, I can just figure it out as I go. Um, the other thing I learned is that, and it was, this was a hailstorm that we were doing is that adjusters can be even worse jackasses than contractors. And that was surprised to me. Um, yeah. and, I, and I have, I have a little bit of empathy for roofers. Oh, well, I should say I have a lot of empathy for roofers. Um, the third thing obviously is, they don't get paid just for showing up. Right. But right. when, um, I go to a house as when I was going to a house as a, as a roof salesperson or, you know, you know, doing siding and gutters and all that stuff. And I meet adjuster a, and there's obvious damage everywhere. And I'm like, and I had already been an adjuster for like 15 years at this point. So I'd, I'd seen a bazillion hail claims. I know what hail damage looks like. I pay for it every day. And the guy, digs in his heel and says, no way. No, we're not paying for that. Oh, we can't pay for that because uh, depreciation. I'm like, well, that doesn't make zero sense. I mean, and he's got his stone walls just won't even pay. It won't, just won't do it. Won't do right. it. And I think because I'm there, right? So, and then the next house I go to, it's, there's a couple of holes in one side of the siding and a ding or two on a window wrap, right? And I get up on the roof and the roof is two years old. And I'm like, well, I mean... You know, I'm as the, on the roofing side, right? I'm looking around it. I'm like, I probably, I probably wouldn't buy this roof, but you know, might as well have the adjuster take a look at it. Right. Let them decide. And then they Got, just buy the whole thing. And you're like, yeah, what? comes to the top of the ladder. He's like, all right, well, just give me your diagram. We'll go ahead and get the sucker written up for you. I was like, what? Right. It's like, you, do you don't, do you want to like take a, he's like, no, I, I trust you. We're good. I'm like, I didn't even say it was damaged. I said, just take a look at it, you know? And no, no, we're good. We'll just, we'll just send him a check and we'll move on down the road. And I was like, so I totally understand, you know, when, when, uh, as a, as a adjuster, I show up to, um, um, an inspection and there's a, a roof sales guy there. Um, or maybe there's two or three dudes and there's a dude up on the roof and they're all like, you know, bodybuilders and they're wearing their little sister's t-shirts and lifted <laughs> pickup trucks and all that kind of thing. They have to kind of put up like, there's a, it's a strategy to that. Right. And it's, so it's, it's, they don't know what kind of adjuster I'm going to be. If I'm going to be the guy who just floats, just, just shooting checks out everywhere for everything, no matter what, or if I'm just going to say no to everything. Um, right. so Long ago, I just kind of developed some some empathy, and and it made it made like contractor adjuster inspection, you know, meetings go way like the anxiety level and the stress just dropped when I said, Absolutely. you know what, these guys they're not getting paid just to show up. They are, um, you know, they don't know what they're going to get. Right? It's it's a mystery box that they're going to open it up and it's going to punch them in the face or it's going to you know be a a, a check. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? 
Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. If I say, you know, when I go to this house, even if I'm in an area where it's like, it's a fringe area and probably lightly hit or not hit at all, maybe I'm like, I'm going to keep an open mind. I have an obligation to the, the homeowner to say, you know, there's a possibility that this could have hail damage on it and I'm buying it, buying roof and gutters and right. an elevation siding or window or whatever. Could be like, who am I to say? Right. And the second I say it to myself, like, anxiety and stress just drop away even though i know i'm going like all the hail claims are all over there and i'm going this way and with that attitude when i meet with a guy you know being like totally like open-minded to everything he's talking about and then talking about it in a reasonable way i found the guy will be like oh okay that's cool and the next time i see that guy he'll say like you know well listen you know uh we took a look at this one. We weren't sure, you know, whatever you say is, is cool. We didn't tell the, the homeowner anything, but you know, we just wanted this. You start to, to build rapport right. over a summer with, with these guys, especially if you're in a little small town and you're seeing the same guys over and over again. Um, so when we talk about, I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but you know, when we talk about well, like sales, it, it goes for like every possible like interaction that you have. Right. Right. No, absolutely. I love, I love how you frame that because Somewhere along the way, we've missed the human element of like, guys, right. we're not like enemies here. I'm just someone who's doing a job because I have bills to pay because I'm a human being on earth and that's just how we live. And you're right. also a person on earth who has bills to pay or a family to feed and you're just doing this job, you know? And um, something that you mentioned that you said, it actually reminded me of something I have on my wall. You said, I like to go in with an open mind. And it's interesting that that drops the anxiety because now you're not going in like, is this going to be an argument? Is this going to be yeah. high tension? It doesn't have to be. You try to be as objective as possible and just remember like all human interactions are going to be impacted by what energy we bring to the interaction. And I tell this to the roofers all the time too. I'm like, look, if you're showing up and the adjuster is expecting you to just be another jackass who's up in arms, who's going to be difficult and like beat on, beat on his chest and demand the sun and the stars, guess how they're going to respond, right? Like be the one that's not like that. And when you said have an open mind, I actually have this on my wall. It'll probably be backwards. I'll read it to you, but I have this, uh, framed up on my wall, it says, have a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing. And it's really kind of a <laughs> nice approach to things. But the reason why that's so impactful is it's like, don't have any expectation. Because if you're attached to any, any expectation whatsoever, whether it's the person's going to be a dick, there's not going to be damage here, you're already setting yourself up for resistance, and that's going to cause tension. So just remember, you know, we're all just people and, and you're right. Like, I love that you made that point about roof, roof salesmen don't get paid to show up. Like these are some of the hardest working people that you'll probably ever meet. They're going out, they make their own paycheck. They have to do a very difficult task every day, knock a hundred doors in a day and tell me that your psyche is not beat down sometimes. Like that's hard work. Yeah. You know, you're climbing around in the hot heat, but the same thing, you know, it's like, adjusters have sometimes a crappy job too. You're also walking around in the heat. You're doing a lot of paperwork. You're dealing with homeowners that are probably difficult sometimes, you know, so we're all just trying to do a job. And at the end of the day, we just have to be reasonable, kind to each other and try to help each other do the job and treat the homeowner. Remember that mutually we have this customer and we want to do right by them, whatever that looks yep. like. Yep, for sure, for sure. And and I tell I tell people, I say, listen, everybody's your customer. Like I don't care, you know, if you got your red shirt on and it's got a little, you know, logo on it from an insurance company and you're at the grocery store or you're in the drive through, whatever, that person's your customer. The person at the checkout, you know, the guy sweeping the floors, 
the general manager of this place or the your manager, the carrier manager, the cat team manager, the, the file reviewers. You know, we have a lot of people on our side that are like, when we turn a file in, it goes, it can get sent back to us, right? You know, I forgot, to, I misspelled something in a note on the file, right? So it gets sent back, right? That can make a person get like, get their panties in a, in a wad and get on the phone and start calling managers. And, oh, what's this? This is baloney. I, 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 I use spell check. And that's, that's correct. You know, whatever, <laughs> just, just fix it. Right. That person, you know, a file reviewer, it's like, it's like, it, it, I guess the long story short, I mean, everybody's got like some piece to part to play in, in all of this and they're all trying to get through their day and they're all trying to pay right. their bills. Right. You know, so well, that reminds me of a lesson. Have you ever heard of uh, a book called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz? No. It's a great book. It's like he's like a, a teacher of the Toltec. If you've heard of that, it's kind of like yeah. a sort of way of living and, and way of interacting with the world. Um, it's not like religious. It's more like a spiritual way just of, of interacting with the world. One of the four agreements he has is nothing is personal. Don't take anything personally. Yeah, so like what, for sure. What you're talking about, you know, whether it's like, oh, the spelling error. Well, you could take that personally and be like, oh, no way. or you could just be like, he's just doing his job. Like his job is to make sure we look good to our customers. And we look competent. So my bad, I made a typo and maybe, you know, like it's not personal and yeah. neither is the interaction of you showing up and running into a, another insurance adjuster or a roofing contractor. It's like, we're just here interacting we're playing this game of being a human being on earth you know you don't have to take everything personally right well and now that you know it makes me think of, i have a question for you um so i've dealt with hundreds of thousands of contractors public adjusters salespeople, canvassers you name it i've met them out of, out of houses i would say probably 90 percent, 85 to 90 percent of those guys and gals have been super kind, super professional. Um, but then there's about 10 or 15% that were like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you go to happy hour with your adjuster buddies. You're like, let me tell you about this one I had today with this guy. Um, I've had, I've had guys, and I'll give you a specific example. Um, I get up on the roof with this, this young man and he was in his early twenties. I was in my early thirties. So I wasn't, you know, a whole lot older than him, but we get up there no spatter, no dents, no dings, no pings, no bird poop. We can't, you know, sun and moon stars, which we, you know, from our perspective, that's really bird poop, moss and like boot scuffs, yeah. you know, that's because that's what you're circling. Um, right. Again. <laughs> nothing up there. The the vents are the, the real light gauge metal and they're nothing on them, right? They're just pristine. I, and I've been buying, I mean, this was on a big storm and I was buying roofs all over the place. This one I couldn't. And he's like, I'm like, man, I'm not, I'm just not seeing what I need to see to, to get this one bought. And he's like, he's like, well, yeah, I think you're right. You know, I'm not really seeing anything on the vents or this, you know, the gutters look fine and everything. So, you know, we'll just, I guess we'll just catch you on the next one. Right. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, that was easy. Right. So take some yeah. more pictures and stuff and then climb down and we both get down to the bottom of the ladder and the homeowner standing in the driveway. And I get ready to start saying something to like say, well, you know, everything looks pretty good. And as I'm in the middle of saying that he cuts me off. And he's like, he's like, well, you know, your adjuster, you know, he feels that there isn't any damage to the roof. We, we absolutely think that there is, you know, we're going to escalate this. And he's like, I was like, and I, I lost my cool on that kid and like chewed him up and down because that was yeah. complete and total backstabbing baloney. But what right. kind of a strategy is that? Like, is that a, would, that's not a real sales strategy, is it? I mean, absolutely. come on. No, absolutely not. You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for, like you're just a number on a roster? Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work, but still small enough to know you by your first name? Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Paysetter Claim Service. Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Paysetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, you'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you 
as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. And Paysetter is bringing training to a city near you. Check out their summer tour dates at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. That's, you know, we talked about, I think, it, what do they call it? The, the 80, 10, 10 rule. And that applies to almost everything. We're like 10% of people are just great. And, and in sales, we say they're yes people, right? 80, the other 10%, then you have another 10% of people who are just like, no people, they're assholes. They're just like the, the curmudgeons, right? Sure. And then right. you have 10% of people, most people are just like pretty cool and they're going to be responding to your energy, whatever that looks like. So that is nothing that any logical person would be teaching. Like that's insane. It, anybody who knows how to deal with human beings, even on a tiny level would never ever do that. Like if you really didn't, let's say that you really didn't believe that the roof shouldn't be totaled. Let's say you thought there was damage and the adjuster didn't agree. I would just shut my mouth and be like, all right, well, do you mind? Here's what I do. If, if there is actually damage up there, which we're not even talking about that, but if there is damage right. up there and I have an adjuster who's just like not circling anything, usually I'm like, I'm like, hey, do you mind showing me what you're looking for? Like, I'll just say that and kind of put the ball in their court. And that either forces them to look and show me things, or I'll say, hey, you know, there's a couple things I noticed up here. I'd love to get your opinion on it. Like, do you mind if I yeah. just kind of show you what I see? And then I'll start, because I never mark up the roof. Like, I don't go and have a test square and all that. For, I've let the adjuster do their job. Obviously, I don't think they're all retarded or anything like that. So we show up and I'm like, hey, do you mind if I kind of just show you what I found? And if they don't agree, I'm like, all right, well, you know, we can agree to disagree. They're going to go down, talk to the homeowner. After they leave, I can sit down and say, you know, I was a little surprised at how the adjuster handled that. He didn't really circle a lot of the stuff that I did. And, and I've got pictures of everything that I found. I would love to get a second opinion. Why don't we get a, a reinspection and get a different adjuster to come out here? But to blatantly be disrespectful and do that in front of, I mean, he probably embarrassed himself to the homeowner too. The homeowner probably thought he was an idiot for acting that way. That's just, that's just the one-off, like that kid didn't know what the heck he was yeah. doing, probably really desperate to make a commission and is just like, maybe that was the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, he finally got be, lined yeah. up, got the claim and he's like, you know, I need to make money. I haven't made any money yet. I only get paid on deals and then it doesn't get approved. And he snapped, you know, just like you snapped at that moment. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. And generally speaking, I mean, I think there's only been maybe one or two other times where I was like, hold on a second, pal. And then like you to doing this number out of thousands right. of claims because right. it's not worth it. Right. Cause when you're standing in somebody's front yard and the, the homeowner, whether that guy canvassed and said, I want to be there when the adjuster shows up or they called the company and said, Hey, come and take a look at our roof. Either way, they're there with her permission of the homeowner. It's not my job to say, well, this guy is just a storm chaser and he's a whatever he's there. Right. And the homeowner wants him there period. Right. So if I start fighting with the, with the guy that they want to have there, I'm already like, so the insurance company has already got kind of an, a, of a reputation it's just sort of a conventional wisdom that they're going to try to save money on your claim and drag out the process. Right. That's, right. and they, they, it can be perceived that way. Um, when you have an incompetent adjuster, which happens a lot, it's, it's kind of a problem on our side of, of things. Freely admit that I've done several videos about it. So one of the reasons why I started doing this, um, we need consistent quality training on our side so that when, you know, send out a hundred people and they'll go to the same house. You're going to get the same report, right? That's, that's what we want. Um, right. but if I lose my cool and I start, you know, yelling and screaming and getting the guy's face, it makes both of us look like, or it makes, makes whoever's yelling is the one who looks like a jackass. But, I mean, everyone looks dumb. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone's uncomfortable. Everybody looks dumb. It's one of those things. Like, what do they say? If you're having an argument with somebody and like, they're yelling at you, if you, if you're yelling too, both of you are like, you look guilty, but if you just let that person yell and go off and you like, keep staying calm, who looks dumb? The other yeah. person, right? Yeah. So, you know, we have to look at things like 
it's not that, oh, some adjusters are just dicks. Oh, some roof salesmen <laughs> are just idiots. What it is is some humans are idiots and some of them happen to be adjusters and some of them happen to be roof salesmen. Some of them work at JC Penney. Some of them work at Outback Steakhouse and some of them are the president of the United States of America. Can I get an amen? Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> right? so it's just, you know, you're dealing- It's a family with- show. <laughs> right. You're just, you're dealing with people and again, you just have to try to be a good human being. And I think there's just the tension of people are trying to, they're trying to make a paycheck and there's that's stressful for most people, you know, yeah, you're dealing with for sure. every day. So that's just how she goes sometimes. Yep. Yep. Well, you know, it feels like sometimes if you turn the news on for five seconds, it's the entire world is full of idiots. So, <laughs> exactly. yeah. um, so I often tell, new and even experienced adjusters that they really should be treating their their career like a business right and as you as a uh, as a clearly you're a business owner and i think from that view it seems like you may be doing okay for yourself i mean i don't know um <laughs> what sort of like personal skills um do you think are required for somebody to be successful in a career um where you're really the only person that's going to be responsible for whether you eat that day or not. Right. So in other words, um, what is, what does it look like for somebody who's, who's wants to get into this kind of work, whether on your side or my side and knowing that it's not, you show up and you just start, you know, you clock in and then you get a paycheck at the end of the week. Right. Exactly. Well, the first thing is belief. Like you have to believe that you are capable of creating your own abundance, right? Like there's a, one of the one of the, the quotes that I like to drop on people is Dr. Seuss. And he says, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself any direction you choose. And I love that because when we're talking about doing a job like what you or I do, when, some people would argue like, you have to be a natural born salesman to do that. You have to be just one of those freaks oh, of no. nature, yeah. you know? But it's just, it's really not true. Does that help? Absolutely. Obviously, if you have like a knack for connecting and talking with people and you're just outgoing and extroverted and, you know, that's how your brain works, that's great. But we're not talking about like being blessed to be born to become seven foot one like Shaquille O'Neal so that you can dunk a basketball like, you know, right. where maybe we're five two and that's just never going to be in the cards for you. Right. Or like, you know, you're some freak with an alien brain like Elon Musk and you're going to invent <laughs> SpaceX like Right. obviously we're talking about like, can you walk around and talk to people? That's all it takes. Yeah. Right. And so if, if you believe like there's literally no reason that I, I cannot do that, that's step one. Step two is accepting. See, most people are like, they're on the beaten path, right? It's like go to high school, go to college, go to debt with your degree and then go you know, work in the rat race until you die in the nine to five and you clock in and you clock out. And every year, maybe you have a chance to make a dollar more an hour. Like that's the safe and secure route, which I would argue is not, it's not very safe and secure for somebody to be able to say, we're cutting the company in half because we're, you know, we're automating half of it. And we, you know, this was a bad year. The economy down. So you have to be willing to experience or expose yourself to temporary discomfort, understanding that, for example, we'll talk about the roof sales part. If you're gonna be a roof salesman and you start today, guess what? If you're on commission only, even if you sold one today, you you inked a deal this afternoon, by the time that the whole process is done, the adjuster finally comes out a week later, the paperwork shows up and then we go and then we have to supplement it. And then we come back and we gotta order the materials and we schedule the bills and the materials get delivered and then the roof gets built. And then after that, we have to send off for depreciation and we have to send the check to the mortgage company. And then the com- customer has to send. After all of that, the fastest you're gonna see that money is 30 days. And that's really, that's like very ambitious. Right, Probably gonna right. be five or six weeks. So a lot of people will take that and be like, well, I can't afford, I can't afford to do that. I can't afford that. Or like what you have to be willing to be uncomfortable for a minute 
to be able to expose yourself to that opportunity. And the other thing is too, like the learning curve, right? We're talking about something where you're responsible for your own results. So a lot of people won't start something. And I'm guilty of this sometimes too, with like dumb stuff, but a lot of people won't even try if they don't know for a fact, which is impossible, if they don't know for a fact, they're going to succeed on day one. Like they right. try it the first time and they win, they give up. And so they're like, well, if I don't have that guarantee, I just don't, I can't take that risk. I can't afford that risk right now. But guess what? When we're babies and we're like learning how to walk, what is it? I can't remember how many thousands of times an infant falls down before they oh, yeah. fight, get on their own feet. But they don't think about it like that, right? Like, but people will be like, I'm going to try to knock a couple doors today. And they'll knock for one day and they'll be like, it's too hard. I can't do it. And then they'll go work at freaking Applebee's for $4 an hour and hate their life and never be able to move to where they want to live. They can never go on the vacations they want to live on, right? So you have to be willing to do what it takes and accept temporary discomfort in order to do that. I could go on and on and on here, but um, those are like the two first baseline mindset things that I would say. Sure. But then from there, it's like consistent daily activity. Like, okay, you have to have a plan. All right, what are what are the averages? If I know that it takes me 12 doors to line up one appointment, then all right, how many appointments do I need? If I make, this is gonna be my average job size, this is my average commission, what's it gonna take? And then every single day you go, I have to knock 35 doors today until before I can go home. And I do that every single day. And I know that if I do that consistent daily activity, it's gonna work for me. Like it's impossible for it not to, right? I would have to be right. the absolute- Law of personal. averages. Right, exactly. So just accepting those things daily, you know, consistent daily activity and then, being authentic, like that's one of the things that I think it falls by the wayside too much. And this applies to everybody in every industry. Be an authentic version of yourself, like be a good person and just be yourself to your customers. Like you don't need to act like a sales robot. You don't need to be a, you know, state farm robot. You don't need to be any of those things. Like just <laughs> genuinely connect with people and have Empathy, like you said, you know, you brought this up before. Genuinely take interest in the people that you're meeting, whether that's your your peers or your, you know, if you're a jester meeting a roofer or the other way around, you're meeting the homeowners. Like, just be a good person, and people feel that. Like, oh, this person genuinely cares. Like, they're here to listen to me, and you know, when you bring that energy, just that opens so many doors. It's magic. It makes magic happen for you. Are you interested in more than just punching a clock and paying the bills? Wouldn't you rather be on the A-team, surrounded by the best of the best in the industry? Then you need to check out Eberl Claim Service. For well over 30 years, Eberl's philosophy of treating adjusters as they wish to be treated has allowed them to establish a vast network of the most professional, educated, and dedicated adjusters in the industry. So at Eberl, you're in good company. If you're a motivated and compassionate adjuster slash claims professional, Eberl wants you to represent their organization. Go to jobs.eberls.com right now and get started with Eberl Claim Service. For real, absolutely. And, and you know, you talk about like, um, you know, people who don't feel like they're a good salesperson, right? So it sounds like, you know, when you were in college, you're probably, you're, you're clearly a naturally gregarious person who's, you know, probably a bit of a natural salesperson, right? So, I mean, yeah. sell $35,000 worth of scissors, you know, in a summer, probably, you know, it's, you, you got some personality, let's just put it that way. Um, yeah. for me, like I was like heavily part of my identity was like, you know, there's no way I could do a sales job. Cause I just, you know, I just, I don't know. I don't even know what I was thinking. Um, and not that I would like wanted a sales job. I knew that sales jobs could be really lucrative, but right. I had a as part of my identity that I sucked at sales, which put it that way. So I had a, I had a negative belief in my, you know, in my personality, that said sales isn't yeah. part of this. And, it, and I would, could say it probably had an effect in a lot of different parts of my life where, you know, having that sort of like negative self-talk would, you know, affect how interactions would go with people. Right. Until. 100. Yeah. So until I became an adjuster and I realized that I have to like, I have to, you know, I've always been a friendly person and I can get along with people pretty easily, I think. 
But when you're talking to somebody and you need them to understand A through, you know, G, and you need to convince them of, you know, L, M, N, O, right? Um, you have to, that's sales, right? You have to be able to um, understand, look at body language. You have to understand empathy and rapport, building rapport with people. Um, and I kind of, it's kind of like on our side, you know, it's, it's not that much different, I would say, as, as far as like the kind of the structure of the way we work, because um, I sort of look at that learning curve. Like I heard somebody, I think it was on Jocko's podcast, um, and he was talking about, somebody was saying this, that being a Navy SEAL, like going to Navy SEAL training, when you first, the first time you go to, to the, you know, to clear rooms and stuff like that in training, you, you know, or you get into a gunfight, right? you're, you don't remember what happened. Everything slows down or everything speeds up. Or you can't hear, you get tunnel vision and all this kind of stuff. And this guy said that it's like being in a car accident, right? You can get into a car accident and be completely conscious the whole time where you're not, whether you're injured or not and not remember any of it. Right. But if you get into 10 car crashes a day and you do that every day for a year, then you're going to be able to like, handle yourself in a car crash, right? You know, it's obviously, right. you know, you'll be able to, to be lucid and be proactive and be able to, to recognize when something might happen because it starts to build a muscle memory. Like, and that's with, with all these interactions with homeowners and with contractors and with your management at your company, whoever, right. You start to like, you know, understand where people's objections are going to be. And it's ex experience, I think, you know, more, probably more than anything, you understand where their right. objections are going to are going to come from, and you could tell how somebody's going to like react to what you say, no matter if it's good or bad, by the by their body language and their eyebrow and their you know th the questions that they're asking you, right. um, and then you start to be able to like head things off. Like I know that guy; he's getting ready to ask me what happens if a contractor comes and says it's higher, right? So I immediately you know it's, it's a part of my spiel. And by the way, you know we're looking at the totals. If you get a couple of workers out here and they say it's going to be more than this, just give me a call and I'll get it worked out with those guys. Right. Right. And then he's like, oh, okay. And his hands on the hips or, you know, relaxes. He's not going to pick up the phone as soon as I leave and call his agent. Um, so I did a whole video um, about becoming an adjuster or changing careers really after the age of 50 or like 40 or 50. And one of the things was belief. I mean, you have to, like you said, you have to have faith is, was part of it really. We have to have faith that it's not just something that other people do. You can do it too. It is not right. rocket science. None of this is right. It's just it's a matter of, yeah, it's a matter of no one, you know, having like a, like a baseline of training, like taking your training, understanding the whole, all the parts of the process. I'm, I haven't looked at your training. Um, it's premium training for sure. And I'm, I'm sure it's absolutely worth it. But I, I would imagine that part of that is understanding if you're wanting to become a, 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 get into construction sales, you know, what kind of negotiation should you do with the company that you're going to work for? Right. So all these different things that, uh, you know, people who just show up to the storm site with, you know, they heard about the job the week before are going to crash and burn unless they've got that foundation, that baseline of knowledge. And then from there, they just have to believe, well, okay, that guy's doing it. She's doing it. He's doing it. Why can't I do it? Right. So you've got, so you have faith and belief. And as far as like, you know, when you have like a strategy and a plan, like for a well, while, I got to knock 35 doors today. Cause I'm, you know, I, I know that I can close, you know, 6% of those or whatever it is. Um, or, you know, I can close X number in a week. If I, if I look at 35 a day or knock 35 doors for us, it's production, right? So we have to have the ideal adjuster has to have high quality, has to have really high qual uh, customer service, has to have an accurate file. So they write a, a good estimate right out of the box. I always tried to meet contractors so that we could look at that number and say, that looks good. Or if it doesn't, like, well, where can we, how can we make this number good for you, right? That claim's closed right. pretty much forever, right? Because if the guy agrees, as long as they don't find something else, or the, or the homeowner decides to cancel that guy and hire somebody else, right? So I have to do all that, but I also have to close a lot of claims. Like when when these hurricanes come um, and adjusters get out there and it's their first or second storm event, 
their managers are going to be hammering on them to, to get out and scope and scope and scope and scope and scope. And when they scope for a week or they scope for 10 days, you know, the, the homeowners are like, oh, okay, great. Somebody was here, but they're probably not going to hear from that guy again for another two weeks because now he's got to sit down and try to figure out how to write these all up. And then when he, and that'll take several days, right? So now we're like two weeks into this thing. And then after that, he's going to, you know, well, okay, I got these all done. I'm going to upload them. And then, They'll get approved or not approved or whatever. Every single one of them comes back because he got the wrong header on the estimate. He didn't put the right depreciation in. He's got the wrong price list. He's got the wrong this, the wrong that. We're not paying for this. We are paying for that. Why didn't you put this? You know, all that stuff, right? But now he's got to go back and correct all 40 of those files. So that's another couple of days. And pretty yeah. soon he's, he's pushing a month with no closed claims, right? Yeah. So that guy's not going to get any claims, any new claims on that event. He might even get some of his claims taken away. Whereas if I show up and I'm, even if I'm brand new and I'm, I'm like, all right, I'm going to just take this slow. I'm going to go look at one this morning at nine o'clock and then I'm going to go to the help room. I'm going to write it up and that claim, I'm, my job for today is to close this one claim, right? You got to close claim on the board and you do that every day. And then you get to the point to where, you know, for uh, on our side, if you can close a lot of claims, they give new claims to the people who are producing, right? So it's, you get more work on that event, right? And if, I, if I'm like in the top 10% or the top 20% producers on a storm, and I've got, you know, good above average, you know, metrics for everything else. And then, you know, I, I did really well in the storm. I was one of the last guys there. They're calling me for another storm. Whatever they can get, because I produced for them. I did a good job. The carrier liked me. So it's in my best interest to do the same thing. Well, all right, how many can I do in order to, you know, get in front of my production and make sure that, you know, what else can I do in the file to keep it from reopening? All those things, right? So it's, there is a lot of, it's for, on, for new people, it's super stressful. For somebody who's been doing it for a while, you know, like you, if you were to like go out and, and sell roofs right now, it probably would be a breeze because you know everything that you're going to say, you know, and it's, You've, you've got the muscle memory in there. You've, you've, you've experienced probably every possible scenario with every possible homeowner and right. you're comfortable in it, right? You're comfortable in, in the skin of the person who's a great salesperson doing that kind of work. So, you know, long story short, you know, we're, it's, we're just people. And the, I think the thing that's, and you can agree or disagree, I'm sure you'll probably agree with everything I say, but if, if we want to go from being just like, okay, salespeople or adjusters to like exceptional people, you know, who are crushing it and knocking it out of the park, there's not, the, the step between those two worlds is not that big, right? Right. Totally. Absolutely. It really isn't. It's, it's again, getting through the learning curve, you know, words that might be more helpful to people instead of saying like, you just have to have faith. Right. Doesn't that sound like weak? Like you just have to believe and then, you know, to work. I like to talk about having confidence and conviction yeah. and confidence really comes from two things. It, it comes from conviction and it also comes from like genuinely knowing your shit. Like when you're brand new at anything, right. Whether you're doing the adjuster side or doing the roof sales side. And you like, I remember when I got started, I didn't know anything about roofs. I couldn't talk intelligently about anything. Sure. I didn't have a book with scripts on it. I was really like BSing my way through a lot of stuff. So I had to really fake confidence, which that's another tip for people. Fake it till you make it truly. Like you have to sometimes just pretend that you're confident, right? You know, the same thing goes is true with like dating or flirting. Like you might be just butterflies and sweating, but you have to walk up there with your head held high, your shoulders back and like confidently ask this woman what her name is. If you go up there and you're just like, mm -hmm, right? That, Cause that's how you feel inside. You're not <laughs> She's gonna be like, shoe fly. Change your diaper, like is there someone I can call? So you just have to, first of all, educate yourself as much as humanly possible, right? Like, like read everything you can get your hands on, watch everything you can get your hands on. And when you understand the technical parts of the job, 
like now I know, okay, I, I know how to talk about hail damage. I know how to identify it. I know how to talk about the insurance process. I know what RCV means and how the deductible works and what depreciation is. And, and I know what objections people are going to give me. So I'm not totally thrown off. And I truly have conviction in the value of what I'm offering. I know in my heart of hearts, you can't shake me on this. What I do is awesome. I do a great job. The value that I offer people is incredible. You can't shake me off that foundation. When you have those things and you show up, you're just very grounded in your interaction with people because no matter what they throw at you, you're prepared to have an answer. And I don't mean like, well, if they say that, then you say this. And you're just like, like playing ping pong with words. Right. You are in a sense, but you're really just like, expressing your truth like this is jones i could completely understand why you might feel that way or you know same thing with you like if you have a, if a homeowner that is really upset about the adjustment that you did and you say that there's just no damage right and like well i had a roofer that came over and they said that there was damage and blah blah you can just be like mrs jones i completely understand why you'd feel that way and um there possibly could have been could have been a roofer that was here that said that you have damage I'm telling you, you know, I went up and I did a thorough job and I looked and I, I looked for everything. I did a test square and you explained fully what you did and say, you know, I'd be happy to meet with your roofer if they want to try to show me what they found. But yeah, I yeah, do absolutely. 10 of these, right? Like I do 10 of these a day. I treat every single house like it's my house when I get on it. And I just genuinely didn't see anything that was cause for concern. I'd be happy to come out with a second opinion if, if you have somebody that you want me to, you know, look up there, but that's just what I came up with, you know? And so well, that comes from confidence. If you're not, if you don't fully believe in your ability and what you're offering, like in that case, you were offering this person a, you have nothing to worry about, uh, uh, whatever you want to say, answer, right? That was your close. Yeah. Like, here's the product is you don't have to worry about anything. Okay. And if you really firmly believe that you're not going to be shaken when somebody throws a bunch at you, but if you're not, and you're like, well, I don't know, maybe I did a bad job. And now you're taking it personally or whatever. You're probably going to be like, well, half the roofers out here are idiots and blah, blah. And you're not going to handle that well. And then guess what? Mrs. Jones doesn't believe me either. Yep. So yep. Conviction and confidence are really important. And once you have those, you and you can't just say, well, I just, I don't have that in the beginning. Well, no, nobody does. You have to, right. you, that comes with experience and education, right? So yep. like I said earlier, embrace and accept being uncomfortable in the beginning. Part of being uncomfortable is I don't know what I'm doing yet. And guess what? You're not going to know what you're doing yet until you try and you fail 40, 50, 60 times until you start to catch on. That's just the breaks, kid. Like that's how it goes. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. I mean, and that's, you know, as a business owner, as an adjuster, as a, anybody, you're going to fail. Right. And the question is, is do you, do you think of the failure as a, oh, well, it's, this must be, it's, it's proof. It's proof that I'm not cut out for this. Or do you take that as, as, as just an example of one thing that just didn't work? Right. Bingo. Thomas Edison said that. Right. And yeah. And exactly. so, I mean, I call it grit. I mean, I want patience, persistence, determination, you know, have set, creating a plan that includes, you know, every st step that you're going to need to get prepared for this and then taking action. Right. So picking up the phone, it's, it's almost right. like, you know, no matter what, like you, a person can sit around and like, lay awake at night and look at the ceiling and have anxiety and have trouble falling asleep and then be thinking about it during the day while they're trying to get their stuff done. When all they have to do is make, pick up the phone and make a phone call to get on a roster or to sign up for some training um, or to, to, to buy a, a, you know, a, a adjuster pre-licensing or something like that to take a step, right? Because every step, like this starts to build momentum. Like you can, you can have snowball effects that are positive, right? That kind of build on themselves, but it takes Absolutely. action, determination, and grit. And the faith part, you know, it's, yeah, it's a little woo woo, I guess, but it's also kind of the, the overarching piece of it that says, I believe that if I do all this stuff, even yeah. though it doesn't look like it now and it doesn't, I've it been doing this for three weeks, I can't feel, I can't see, you know, any forward motion, nothing seems to have changed that's going to, right? As you keep right. pushing forward. Fire in three, two, one. Coming up on Adjuster TV, 
Get an exclusive inside look at the forensic testing lab at Hague Education and Hague Research and Testing. Learn how Hague can help you get noticed by IA firms and make you a better adjuster. Only on Adjuster TV. Are you new to the professional claims industry? Confused about exactly how to get started as an IA? Worried that the advice you're getting on social media might not be totally accurate? Then you need to check out IA Path. IA Path helps adjusters get started in their new career in 90 days with online mentorship programs and training. If you need help getting started or making a transition as an adjuster, head over to iapath.com slash adjuster TV for a free video course showing you how to get working in the next 90 days. That's iapath.com slash adjuster TV. Right. Absolutely. Like it, the tiny little bits of action that you put in, if you just keep doing those, like I always talk about breaking down your long-term goal. Maybe your long-term goal is like, I have to do a hundred deals this year. And I want to get to a yeah. million dollars in sales. When you start from ground zero, that seems like an astronomical, absolutely impossible feat, right? You're like, ah. Oh. But if you just put your head down and it's like, Every moment you just go, okay, I'm going to answer this email right now. Okay. And then I'm going to make that phone call. All right. Then I'm just going to knock five doors. Like you just do these little tiny things. You do that day in and day out. And then all of a sudden you're, you look back and you're like, oh, dang, look at all the leads I've created and the messages yeah. I've sent out and the contracts I've accumulated and the referrals that I'm getting. So you just have to stop looking at the giant thing. It's like, yeah, I, I love to use um, fitness and weight loss examples and analogies because it's just easy for me to, oh, yeah, to teach yeah, it that sure. way. If you have to lose a hundred pounds, that seems impossible from the get-go. But if you break that down and go, okay, I know that one pound of fat is 3,500 calories. And if I have a deficit of 500 calories a day for seven days a week, that's my 3,500 calories and I can lose a pound a week. So all I have to do is create a 500 calorie deficit during the day. That's, that's all I have to focus on. And then today I do that, boom, I'm done. And then tomorrow, all I have to do is create a 500 calorie deficit. Okay, boom, you're done. And you do that for the whole year and then you did it. Yep, <laughs> right, or however yep. long. Math right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's basically, if you think about it, yeah, and I, I love the the fitness and weight loss thing because, you know, I've I've gone through periods where I like like years and years and years ago, back in the late '90s, I quit smoking, and I gained like 75 pounds in a summer, and I was like Whoa. a balloon. It was terrible, and I was I was like really overweight for about three years. And I woke up one day and I looked in the mirror and I was like, "This is stupid. Why am I doing this?" Completely yeah. changed my diet and everything, but you know, and I, I had a couple. Everybody does it, or a little roller coaster thing where you get like, you know, holidays or COVID, and then you've got to like kind of get back on a, on a program or whatever. But the thing I realized was is that, you know, it's like walking, like going for a hike up the mountain, right? It's going to take you twelve thousand steps, and it sounds like a Confucius, you know, Chinese, you know, ancient wisdom thing, but they're wild. You have to take every single step. You have to lose every single like microgram. It's got to, it's all got to come off and it doesn't just come off in big chunks. It doesn't just disappear. Right. So you've got to, you have to be patient with the process. Right. And that's, that's part of the faith thing, I think. But, you know, so to change gears a little bit, I, I just, just, just occurred to me um, as a woman who's in kind of a male dominated I, you know, I think it's honest, it's, it's safe to say, or it's true to say that it is, it's a, it's a male dominated industry. The adjusting side, you know, in the field at least is still pretty male dominated. How do yeah. you feel that has affected your ability to be successful? Or if it I has? I just don't really, th I think that on a positive note, there was, it was negative in the beginning and then it became very positive. I think like in the beginning, I feel like anyone who came across my material before I had a name and a brand and a, you know, seven years of a track record of helping people transform their businesses. I'm sure when my first ad started coming out and I make out, cause I was only 25. I mean, I was a kid, right? 
So if I was even that old, I think I might've been younger than that. I think it might've been 20, I guess it was 2014 and I was born in 88. So whatever that is, I'm not good about 26. All right. So I started putting out content and people are probably like, who's this dumb blonde 17 year old kid, you know, <laughs> trying to tell me how, trying to tell me that she's going to, you know, increase my average order size by this much and teach me how to sell rules, blah, blah, blah. But I knew that was going to happen in the beginning. And I just didn't like, I didn't read any of the trolling comments really. Or if I did, I didn't feel like I had to respond or anything. I'm like, my performance speaks for itself. And I just know that. And I mean, that had to, the same thing had to happen when I was going door to door. Like to, I, I remember somebody, some guy like looking at me up and down, like giving me the side eye when I was standing on his porch. And at that time I was only 21 years old or 22. And I'm sitting here telling him that I'm a roofing expert and I'm going to be like, you know, climbing on his roof. <laughs> yeah, sure and, you are. You know, and he's like, you know, you look like you should be selling Mary Kay. So I just, I don't get attached to those, those, um, ideas or like anybody's judgment or opinion about me. I don't know what anybody thinks about me. It's none of my business. So I just always looked at it. Like I just show up and I do what I do and people are going to see really quickly that I know my, and that's what would always happen. Like that same guy that I mentioned on the porch, my, my ex-husband now at this point, he had showed up a different day. I got the, got the thing signed and my ex had showed up for something. I can't remember what it was, but I overheard him talking and the guy's like, you know, when your wife showed up, he's like, I gotta be honest. I really didn't think that she knew any, anything that she was talking about. He goes, but she really knows her stuff. Like that's what he said. So I just block that stuff out and I just perform and I know that my stuff is good. And again, it comes back to confidence and conviction. I have such conviction in the value that I deliver to people that I don't think about what anybody thinks about me. I just show up and I talk and I, I, you know, drop my gold nuggets and people get a lot of value out of it. And that's just how the momentum goes. So I think in a male dominated industry, it can be a benefit. You know, people probably don't mind looking at a young blonde gal talk, you know, when they're constantly looking at dudes talk all day, you know, <laughs> in the echo chamber, echo chamber of the male dominated roofing business. So right. I'm sure that's positive, but I, to be totally honest, I really don't think about it that much. I just show up and I perform and that's it. So in, any advice for women young or old who who want to get into it sort of this this end of things and and kind of get a you know a piece of the pie so to speak yeah absolutely i think that women can be such incredible salespeople because naturally we're a little we're more empathetic right we're naturally more in tune with people's energies and how they feel and things like that i think the biggest thing that holds women back and i i get this all the time i do coaching calls or people say i'll get business owners email me and say, Becca, like I have this woman who could be a killer. She could be amazing. She just doesn't have, like, she doesn't have the confidence right now to go out there. So I think that women need to just understand, again, it goes back to Dr. Seuss. There's, you're literally just walking around and talking. Like, we're not talking about you having to pick up a 400 pound tire and yeah, maybe the six one, 225 pound guy next to you is going to be better at that. Like you're literally walking around and talking to people. So all you have to do is know your stuff. And then if you're not confident yet, fake it till you make it show up and just keep doing this and act like, you know, you're supposed to be there. I mean, that's, that's what, that's what I had to do. It's really not that hard. Like you have such an incredible opportunity to make it a great income and achieve financial freedom and get off the nine to five rat race, you know, rat wheel. Women yeah. have an incredible opportunity to be good at this. Yeah, I think that that's good advice for anybody because, you know, contrary to popular belief, not every guy is like, you know, blessed with the ability to just go out and make $100,000 every year just because he's a guy, right? Even though it's male dominated, there's, you know, I think there's plenty of opportunities in there for, for men and women. I found them, certainly. Um, and it was just, again, going back to just figuring out everything I got to do, understanding the, figuring out the rules of the game and then figuring out where I can just start to kind of like incrementally, you know, improve every piece and every part, be faster, spend less time, be more efficient doing things. Um, and next thing you know, I'm at, the, I'm at the top of the list, right? I'm getting calls all the time. I'm having to turn, say, oh, sorry, I can't, I'm working right now. I'd love, love to go work for you, but I can't. Um, right. 
which was a great place to be. And I think, honestly, for either one of these professions, why wouldn't you want to, to be at the top? Because why? It was, it, these I mean, these days you can go work at Taco John's for fifteen dollars an hour, get a five hundred dollar sign on bonus, and probably pay your bills and do all right, right? I mean, make it tacos at the drive-through. But that's what I you know. <laughs> this kind of work, yeah, this kind of work is really challenging. And I think for for accepting a mediocre, my point is kind of if you're accepting like a mediocre you know, income from an in mediocre results, then it's absolutely not worth it to me. I, I wouldn't do it for, I wouldn't do it for right. that. Right. People just need to focus on themselves. Like one of the, one of the things I think that is this pervasive issue here that affects everything we're talking about is people worry too much about what everyone else thinks. Like for example, for sure. well, if I don't want to go out there and knock on doors and, and, and get rejected, what if I'm not good at it? who cares? Like, stop worrying about what every single person at the door thinks. What It doesn't affect you in any way. They're right. not hurting you. They're not punching you in the face when they say no. You just move on to the next one. So if you're somebody who's like living out here externally way too much, like, I don't want to feel this person singing this way, just shut up and focus on yourself. Like every moment, it's just like, what's in the circle of my control right now? Okay, that didn't go very well. I'm going to learn from that. I'm going to let's do the next one, right? I'm not sitting here going, wow, person at 123 Oak Street thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> it's like, and then move on to the next one. I'm like, <laughs> Keeps wow. You up at night. Person at one, right? Like, gee, it's like you just move on, right? Move on. And you just learn from your mistakes. And you just, you have to believe that you're capable of doing things. This is not that hard. You know, you're, you're, you're better than the clock in and clock out job that you're going to work until you die and are never going to have enough money to do anything that you want to do. Yep. Like you don't have to be, like I said, Elon Musk or George Clooney or like somebody that just has, you know, and even then you'd argue like, okay, George Clooney, he still had to work to get to where he was. Is he? Oh, handsome? Yeah. Some people don't think he's handsome. Right. But it's like, Skills are something that anybody can create. Talent, it, you're born with, but it, you know, what, what do they say? Talent without work is useless, right? Yeah, for sure. But if you're willing to just say, okay, I am gonna figure this out. I know it's just walking around talking to people. There's no reason I can't succeed. I accept that there's gonna be a learning curve. Obviously, duh, I'm willing to embrace 30, 60, 90, 100, 180 days of maybe I feel like I suck, but I'm going to get through that and it's going to work. You can have anything you want, literally. Anything. Yep, yep or, absolutely. You know? That's the so. grit. That's the grit part of it. Just hanging in there, knowing it's going to suck. It's going to suck. You're going to fail. You're not going to make very good money to start, no matter what. I don't care. I mean, a couple of notable stuff. exceptions. Yeah. But for the vast majority, I mean, you just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and have faith that it's going to happen. Hang in there. Like, right. You have to do, do today. One of the quotes that I always like to share with people is do today what most people won't so that you can have tomorrow what most people can't. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Like, a good Hey, one. are you willing to be uncomfortable for this short window of time so that afterward you can make six figures in nine months? And if you say no, then you deserve to get paid $12 an hour to work 50 hour work weeks and never be able to do anything because you're not willing to do a little, make yourself uncomfortable. Like that's just the truth. For sure. For sure. Well, I think we'll leave it at that, but that was, that was, this has been a really great conversation and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we finally were able to get this, make this happen. So if people want to find out more information about you and, and what you offer and, and kind of where you are on the internet, where can they go? Absolutely. So go to roofsalesmastery.com. Um, you can find all my content there and my different programs. If you're a roofing contractor, my YouTube channel is just roof sales mastery and you can follow me on Instagram at roof sales mastery as well. So all my stuff's there. Um, I also have a Facebook page, of course, so you can follow, give that a follow. And um, if you sign up on my email list on my website, you'll get like a weekly email where I share, drop some gold nuggets and knowledge and stuff like that. Very nice, very nice. Well, thanks again, Becca. 
Becca Switzer from RoofSalesMastery.com. Um, it's been really, really great uh, chatting with you. And I, I think uh, we, we seem to, sh to share some views on, on uh, our, our, you know, there's some overlap between our two worlds, as it were. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for the conversation. Thanks for having me on. And I look forward yeah, to talking. Another time. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.